Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, August 23rd, 2020. We pray that uh, you are resting in God's peace uh, in the midst of this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, this rioting and unrest. Um, we have a good lesson today. We are in Unit Three, we're still in unit three, which is entitled Faith and Wisdom in James. Faith and Wisdom in James. This is lesson 12 from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly as well as the Standard Commentaries. From the Adult Quarterly, the lesson title is Bite Your Tongue. Bite Your Tongue. And our devotional reading comes from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 1 to 11. Our background scripture comes from James, the epistle of James, or a letter of James, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. That's also our printed or lesson text. James, chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. And our key verse is, Even so the tongue is like a little, is a little member, rather, and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And from the NIV, that was the King James Version, from the NIV, that verse reads, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. From the quarterly, our lesson aims are number one, Explain how bits and bridles, ships and rudders, and small sparks illustrate the power of the tongue. Number two, repent of times when the use of your tongue has ignited a destructive fire. And number three, practice controlling the tongue so that it becomes consistently a source of healing and refreshment to others. The lesson has three major divisions. The first is entitled, The Tongue, Small But Big. And that's covered between verses 1 and 4 of chapter 3. The second is, The Tongue is Like a Fire. It's covered between verses 5 and 8 of chapter 3. And then the third is entitled Praise and Cursing. It's covered between verses 9 and 12. Uh, from the standard commentary, for those of you who also use that, uh, our lesson title is Taming, <coughs> excuse me, Taming the Tongue. Taming the Tongue. And additional aims are... Number one, list several consequences of speaking with an untamed tongue. Number two, explain the relationship between lack of wisdom and an untamed tongue. And number three, role play modern situations in which the tongue is used for good or for evil. So before we read our, our first passage, let's go before the front. Our Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your word. Lord, even in the midst of this, um, the great trials that many are enduring uh, during this time of pandemic, as we said, and unrest, uh, we know, Lord, that you are still in control. And we know, Lord, that one of the most destructive things that we have control over is our tongue, Lord, our words, Lord. They can be used for blessing. They can use, be used for healing. They can be used for discouraging. They can be used for encouraging. We pray, Lord, that you give us the wisdom to use our tongues aright, to use our words aright, Lord, as you intend for us to do, to express our love, to express your love for your people, Lord, and all others, Lord. We ask as we understand your word that you would increase our faith and our obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going we're gonna to read our first passage again from the quarterly. 
Uh, that first division is entitled The Tongue, Small But Big. And by the way, um, the first division in the standard is entitled Warning to Teachers, and that, that's covered between verses 1 and 2. So I'm going to read mostly from the King James Version. However, I will be going back and forth um, uh, as uh, as I think I need to for greater clarity. And then maybe before, I, I, I'm sure we've given background and other teachers have given background on the epistle of James, and we won't repeat that. Uh, but we know that uh, James is uh, speaking to the uh, Christians of Jewish uh, heritage uh, that are scattered abroad. And he has spoken already um, about negative ways we can use speech or tongue. In uh, James chapter 1, he speaks about flattering speech. He speaks about partiality. Um, in chapter 2, he speaks about uh, how we can carelessly speak to the poor, uh, about telling them to to be warmed and filled and, and, and not caring for their needs. And so he's already talked a little bit about a superficial speech in chapter 2, verses 16, and, uh, 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 and so forth. So uh, he is... Uh, focusing uh, on the awesome power relative to its size that the tongue has in not only affecting us directly, but affecting everyone and, and, and everything around us, uh, things that are in our circle of influence and even beyond our immediate circle of influence. So as we go through this lesson, uh, let's not look at how others use their tongues but how we use ours. And as I speak, I'm, I'm personally convicted. Uh, I, I, I am regretting uh, a tone that I took with my wife a while back. And, uh, and that, of course, um, uh, became more than it needed to be. And that's probably enough said there. But uh, the Holy Spirit convicts and the Holy Spirit causes us to reconcile when that happens. But uh, it would to God it it does it doesn't happen and doesn't happen frequently. So uh, let's read our our first passage uh, and we'll go from there. So from the King James it reads, "My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all." If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may up obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Now, obviously, we'll be going back and forth to uh, uh, cl uh, clarify some of that uh, that ancient uh, and archa archaic language there uh, between the King James Version and the New International Version. But let's jump in here, verse 1. Again, um, <clears throat> He says, my brethren, be not many masters. Uh, from the NIV, it, it says, not many of you should be teachers, my fellow believers. Uh, and this word translated in the KJV, masters, uh, in the Aramaic is equivalent to rabbi or rabboni. You may remember when... Uh, uh, when Jesus was approached by Mary in John chapter 20, verse 16, she called him Rabboni, which means master or teacher. And so what what is James saying here? First of all, he's saying, <laughs> don't be anxious to be a teacher, and not many of you should be teachers. Uh, why do you suppose that is? Uh, we know in our culture... <laughs> 
uh, teachers are not necessarily regarded with the esteem that they were uh, in at the time uh, the gospel was written, and this epistle was written, I should say. Uh, but in and when this epistle was written, uh, the teachers were highly regarded. They were esteemed. They were respected. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, if they were financially compensated any better than they are today, but it was sufficient, the respect and the esteem that they were given to attract some that uh, were not qualified to teach, perhaps didn't have the, the wisdom, the knowledge, or the temperament, uh, or the control of their own tongues to teach. And, and he gives uh, the reason in part B uh, of that verse. Part B says, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The NIV uh, translates that because you know that uh, we who teach will be judged more strictly. Judged by whom? Judged by the ones that the one that we are accountable to, and that is God. And we are we're not necessarily we're not. Uh, James is not referring to secular teachers here. He's I believe uh, referring to those who are teachers of of God's word, teachers of uh, the Bible, and of course, uh, even secular uh, uh, education was something that was established. And it wasn't secular then, of course. It was a altogether part of teaching that was done in the home. It was done by the church, uh, and uh, it, it, it's uh, this public education is a fairly recent uh, phenomenon. I mean, a hundred or so years old. Uh, but anyway, we won't get into that. Uh, but he's saying those of us, and, and he identifies with uh, the teachers. Him, he is one. Uh, he says, uh, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation or greater judgment. And that is because of the awesome responsibility that teachers have to teach the word accurately, to give the correct interpretation and examples of proper applications of God's word in our lives. And teachers are not just to do that with their mouths, with their words, but with their own actions. Um, if you're going to give an example for someone, if you're going to teach someone something, even parents trying to teach their children speak louder with their actions than they do with their words. Uh, and, and everyone knows that. I mean, there are examples where uh, parents that are perhaps are heavy drinkers or heavy smokers or whatever may tell their children, don't drink, don't smoke. Well, what's going to happen as soon as the child gets old enough to do those things uh, and, and without the parents having any control over them, uh, they're going to do those things most likely. All right, let's move on. I, I'm really going to try to be a little briefer doing this lesson than I than I have, I think, in, in recent weeks. Uh, number two, verse two says, "For in many and, and, and one of the commentators, I believe it's the, the the standard commentator, suggests that." The entire passage is aimed primarily at teachers. I, I don't agree with that. I think James gives some caution uh, to the teachers in the first uh, verse, uh, and then he speaks more generally, certainly uh, to teachers, and, and certainly teachers uh, are, are going to be judged more severely uh, than than others than, that, 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 that don't teach, the lay people, if you will, but I think what he says following verse 1 applies to all and not just teachers. Okay, uh, so he says, For in many things we offend all. Now, I think that certainly uh, uh, addresses the teachers. But again, more generally, the rest as well applies to all, those who teach and don't. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. NIV renders that we all stumble, okay? That's what's meant by we offend. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault 
in what they say is perfect, able to keep his whole body in check. So what do we mean by that? I mean, and, and we're speaking hypothetically because we know that no one is actually perfect. No one can control their words or their tongue perfectly. We know oftentimes when people say things that are offensive, they say, oh, that well, was a slip of the tongue. Uh, when in fact there are really no slips of the tongue. The tongue simply is an instrument that conveys what is in the heart and what is in the mind. It's a tool that uh, that transfers, again, the thoughts and the minds uh, to the hearing of those around. So uh, he's saying if you can control your tongue, your words perfectly, then you have, by extension, you have the amount with the same uh, discipline, you can control everything, every other aspect of your life, okay? Uh, and that would make you indeed a perfect person. Now, this word perfect is sometimes translated mature, and then and certainly it would make you more mature, but in point of fact, if you could control your tongue perfectly, you could have the discipline to control every other aspect of your life perfectly. And that is, again, a hypothetical statement because the only one perfect that has walked this earth is the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, did control his tongue perfectly even when he spoke in anger. I say every other aspect of your life, and we're talking about Christians and believers in Christ. That means spiritually, intellectually, morally, every other aspect of your life. Let's move on. Uh, verse 3 says, Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Now, um, I don't, you don't have to have been raised on a farm or a ranch to know what a bit is. A bit is a metal piece that is attached to a bridle. A bridle, of course, is a harness that uh, harnesses the, how, the horse's head and mouth. And the bit is fitted in the mouth to cause some pain when it's tugged in one direction or the other. It actually causes some irritation and, and, and by it, the uh, the rider of the horse can cause the horse can control the horse if the horse is uh, galloping or moving too fast the rider can pull back on it causing some discomfort in the mouth of the horse causing the horse to slow down or stop if the rider pulls to the right or left it causes some discomfort in the right or left regions of the mouth causing the horse to move in that direction to relieve some pain. So, and, and, and the point is, <clears throat> not, the, not the pain or irritation that it causes the horse, but the relative size of the bit compared to the horse. I mean, the horse is a, the horse is a ton or, you know, 1,500 pounds or whatever. The horse is huge. And uh, the bit is a very small, flat piece of metal but it has tremendous control over this huge animal. Uh, just like, and, 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 and he doesn't want, James is not going to leave the chance that you're going to miss the, the, the point here, this metaphor, okay, and that's what he's using. And by the way, um, a metaphor is something that takes an idea and imposes it uh, on an unrelated but familiar idea to help explain the qualities of the original. That's uh, from one of the commentators, the standard commentators. In other words, it's something that uh, is, is an aid to help us understand uh, something that is, uh, uh, it's relating to. Okay, in this case, the bit is relating to the tongue the relative size of the bit to the horse is relating to the relative size of the tongue and the things that it influences. Okay, so um, whole body. He said you turn the whole body of this horse, this big horse. Now, verse 4 says, Behold, 
also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Now we need to <clears throat> read a part of that, at least in the NIV. Let's read the whole verse again from the NIV. And it says, or take ships. This is another, uh, he's, he's using another metaphor here. And again, I was about to read from the, uh, from the NIV. Uh, it says, uh, or take ships for example, another metaphor, although they are so large, and are driven of strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot, that's the governor, wanted to go, wherever he listed in the uh, old King James. Uh, now, consider the size of a ship, I mean, including the sails. Uh, sails are strong and sturdy and able to withstand strong winds and, and, and move this that move this ship of many, many, many tons, and maybe hundreds of tons along uh, oceans. And, uh, uh, and this huge ship is steered by a very small element, the rudder. Just like the bit is small relative to the size of the horse, the rudder is very small relative to the size of the humongous ship or the huge ship. And so, he, 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 again, uh, he wants you to know, uh, uh, he doesn't want, rather, uh, the reader to misunderstand the, the, uh, the metaphor here. So, in verse 5, part A, and we're moving into our second division, I'll read that in its, in its entirety in just a minute, but for continuity, he says, even so... The tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Even so, in the uh, NIV, it says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. And he goes on to say, Consider what a great forest it sets. Uh, it is, uh, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Now, we're in the second division here uh, in the, in the uh, quarterly, which is entitled, The Tongue is Like a Fire. Uh, I read verse, and, and that's covered between verses 5 and 8. Co read verse 5, verse 6 reads, And the tongue is like a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among its members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and the things in the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now, of course, those verses were read from the uh, KJV, the King James Version. So let's back up again to uh, verse 5. And again, he does not want the readers to miss the metaphor, the comparison that he's making. He says the tongue is a little member. It's small relative to the rest of our body, and it is. I don't, I don't know what the tongue weighs. The tongue may weigh a few ounces. It weighs a few ounces when we weigh hundreds of pounds. And he says it makes great boasts. In other words, it exaggerates. What, what's boasting? Boasting is exaggerating. It is uh, uh, building, your, uh, making yourself appear something larger, much larger and greater than you are. I don't know if you're familiar with um, uh, to how familiar you are with nature and birds and so forth, but uh, the, God designed uh, mating instincts in uh, certain birds, peacocks and others, pheasants and others, 
that uh, 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 cause the males, in most cases, the males trying to attract females, to be able to blow themselves up, to puff their feathers out and make themselves look larger and more colorful than they, than they are naturally. But this is what uh, boasting is, is akin to. The tongue boasts great things, exaggerates things. And he says, consider a great, what a great farce, this is setting on fire nature, a great farce is set on fire by a small spark. And how, oh, how familiar we should be with that. I mean, those of us who grew up hearing the, the public service announcements featuring Smokey the Bear, you know, and him pointing that finger at the screen saying, only you can pre prevent forest fires. Well, and we heard time after time how somebody, you know, just thumped the cigarette out of the car or somebody uh, dropped a match or left a fire that wasn't fully put out and how it, it, it engulfed uh, uh, huge areas of forests. As I record this message, uh, the news is is uh, in, including stories about uh, fires in uh, in Southern California. We know some fires God designs uh, to happen spontaneously to clear uh, some of the thicket, but too often fires are caused carelessly and by something very small, an ember, something very small, relative to the conflagration, the conflagration that. They cause, and he's likening that to the tongue, the damage that the tongue can cause to everything around it. The spark that causes the fire affects acres and acres and, and hundreds and thousands of homes and people in some cases. I read about the uh, recently how uh, the fire, the great fire uh, in Chicago uh, was started uh, by, uh, of course, a, a cow kicking over a lantern and and catching some hay on fire, and some 17,500 uh, buildings were destroyed. Uh, billions of dollars in today's value of property damage was done. 300 lives were lost. So uh, anyway, you understand the, the metaphor. Verse 7 says, he says, in every kind of beast, uh, let me read that from the uh, NIV. Verse seven says, "Oh, I'm sorry. L let me let me finish the thought. Uh, I, I think I may have uh, skipped over six. Let me get back to six. Verse six says, "The tongue also from the NIV. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil." King James said, the "World of iniquity among the parts of the body." Okay, that's our physical body. Uh, he says, it corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it is set on fire of hell. What is he saying there? It corrupts the whole body. You know, I, I, I don't have the, the, the verse at hand, but if you remember Jesus uh, was uh, talking to the scribes and Pharisees about their tradition of washing and, 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 and making sure that whatever they ate was clean and what went into their body was clean. And Jesus said, it is not what goes into your body that defiles you because that goes out as waste, you know. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Uh, I think that... Uh, Hold on a second. No, I thought I had the verse, but there's a there's a, another verse, related verse. How, uh, what comes from Matthew uh, chapter five, verse twenty-two? If we say unto our brother, uh, Raka, and he's talking about in anger, then uh, he said we will be in in danger of hell fire and judgment. Now, but and that's uh, we're going to get to the motivation of uh, this great destruction that the tongue is capable of causing but it corrupts the whole body what what we know about people more than uh what they look like uh you know how they dress and so forth 
what we know about a person's character, about the person, the person himself or herself, the being, is what what is based on what comes out of their mouth. We know whether they're truthful. We know whether they're liars. We know whether they're profane. We know whether they're respectful. We know whether they're encouragers or discouragers, etc. Uh, so that's what he's talking about, how it corrupts the whole body. And then he says, uh, <clears throat> and it influences everything in your, your circle of, of, of influence, the circle of, of life. It, it affects everything. And then it says, he says, and it set on fire by hell. What's the motivator? Who is the motivator? Of course, Satan himself. We know uh, some of us are old enough to remember Flip Wilson and how Flip Wilson used to quip, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil doesn't make us do anything. The, the devil certainly can tempt us. He can sit on your shoulder and have uh, uh, tempt you with things and, and, and maybe embellish lust in your heart. But he doesn't make us do anything, but we act out with our tongue uh, what is in our heart, in the in the wicked and evil heart, uh, and the the motivator, the one who's on the sideline cheering, the one who is doing the the tempting and motivating uh, for that acting out and unleashing of the tongue is Satan, uh, and hell is basically a symbolism for Satan himself. Let's go on to verse 7 now. He says, For every kind of animal, I'm reading from the NIV, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Uh, where's he going with this? I mean, we can probably guess. But he says every kind of animal, and he's grouping them into four major groups, animals, these would be mammals, most likely, birds, reptiles, or what the Bible often refers to as creeping things, and then sea creatures. Those are the four major animal groups. He said they have been tamed. Now, he doesn't mean they've been domesticated and made house pets uh, or even domestic animals, uh, farm animals. What he means is, God, is that man has had dominion over them, over all the animals. There's nothing on this earth that man has not had dominion over. And of course, God uh, declared that we should, that man should have dominion over the earth. See that in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 28. Uh, he is to have dominion over all creatures. Uh, and, it, and, and unfortunately, uh, he's abused that authority that God gave him. Uh, we know even the great whales, uh, which are enormous relative to the size of man and even man's ships, uh, uh, were hunted almost uh, uh, to, not to necessarily to the point of ex extinction, but certainly where they became endangered. Uh, and so man, uh, by what he's saying is man has control over them. In other words, man can control the animals. But, verse 8 says, what can he control? Verse 8 says, but no human being can tame or control the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poisons. So by comparison, man can control all the animals, elephants, I mean, rhinoceroses, lions. And, and this is something that yeah, is really interesting to see. You know, a, a lion tamer, so-called, go into a cage with lions and tigers with a chair and a whip. I mean, he's got a gun on his on on his hip, but that's in case of emergency. But for the most part, he's got them under his control. But but the the irony is, he can't he can control fierce beasts of the wild, but can't control his tongue, and that means not with consistency, not perfectly. And he says, uh, it, it doesn't get tired. The second part of verse eight says it is restless. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poisons. It is uh, 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 anxious to uh, to uh, to boast. It's anxious to speak uh, uh, out of turn, to speak evil, to 
to cause corruption uh, uh, or corrosive influences all around. He's talking about it's a deadly poison. Look at Psalm 140, verse 3, when you have a chance. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 3, verse 13. And here Paul is talking about uh, the throat and the tongue. He's talking about the unrighteous. And he says, their throat is an open sepulcher. With, a po with their tongues... They have used deceit. The poison of asp, or it's a cobra or a snake, is under their lip. So uh, he is uh, likening the tongue as something that is as deadly as a poisonous snake. Verse 9. Therefore, we bless God, even the Father. I'm sorry. Therewith, <laughs> we Bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. That was the KJV version. Let's read that from the, the NIV. And it reads, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. And isn't that the truth? I mean, many of us praise God on Sunday morning. I mean, we get hysterical sometimes uh, in our praise. I remember growing up uh, in the Baptist church and how uh, I'd see women particularly uh, shouting and running up and down the aisles. Sometimes they'd run out of the church and almost into the street. Uh, same women uh, would gossip uh, the next day and throughout the week. Uh, men uh, uh, served on boards with uh, holy as they can be in church, long prayers. And, uh, and, and, and when it came to uh, away from the church and sometimes even in the church, uh, tongues were uh, as corrosive as acid, you know, when it came to how they spoke and how they dealt with uh, others. And so, and, and, and not only that, I mean, we, uh, we uh, present too often uh, a hypocritical face to the world. You know, we, we, uh, we claim to be uh, uh, Christian, we Christ-like, we claim to be children of God. But then when we go out and we assimilate in the world and we act like children of Satan, just like uh, the unsaved, and, and primarily by how we use our tongues. So, I mean, the verse here says we curse men. In other words, we profane, uh, uh, we, we, we actually rail against or we, we, we profane uh, and, and we uh, dishonor we, uh, men, and meaning men and women, and they are created in God's image. Uh, and, and there's a, there's an inconsistency in that, that John, the apostle John points out in his, uh, first epistle. Uh, you may recall from chapter four, verse 20, when he's speaking about, you know, how that inconsistency, he's, verse 20 of first John chapter four says, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So the inconsistency is, we if we cannot love our brother, it, it, then, then uh, what J James is saying, you're lying. You don't really love God. Because if you love God, you're going to love those created in his image and certainly his children, those who were born again, believers in God. Not to say that we are to not love the unbeliever as well, but who is also created in God's image. And all of us have had that image tarnished. That image was tarnished in the third chapter of Genesis by Adam and Eve, our progenitor. Move on. Now we're in the that began the third division 
uh, verse 9 began, the third division of the uh, of our lesson text uh, from the quarterly. It is entitled Praising and Cursing from the Standard Image of God. Let me go ahead and read the rest of those verses, and I'll just read them from the NIV. Uh, beginning at verse 10, it says, Out of the same mouth come praise and cursings. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He is continuing through those verses to use metaphors, comparison. He's laying one against the other. And he's just opposing, if you're just opposing one to the other. Uh, verse 10 says, out of the same mouth, we do praise God. And both commentators uh, make mention of the fact that it was the custom in the days when this epistle was uh, written for the Jews to say that very thing. Uh, Blessed be God, you know, whenever his name was mentioned. Uh, and, 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 and so we, and we know that we praise the Lord uh, in our own ways. We praise the Lord in song. We praise the Lord in other ways. But he's saying with the same tongue, we curse God. And he says, there's an inconsistency there and it should not be. He says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. He says in verse 11, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No, it's either a fresh water spring or it's a salt water spring. They do not flow intermittently. They do not flow together. They, it's either one or the other. And he says, if you are uh, speaking evil against your brothers and sisters, then you really need to check whether you are uh, a freshwater spring or a saltwater spring. And, I, and, 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 and so he's, he's, again, pointing out this glaring inconsistency. And then finally, uh, verse 12 reads, My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So he's he's putting an exclamation point behind it. And we know Jesus pointed out uh, very clearly uh, the fact that a tree is known by what? Its fruit, by what it produces. We are known by what we say. Our character is known by what comes out of our mouth. Now we remember... Um, <clears throat> Peter's confession, you know, we know Peter had some difficulty with this, uh, at least before the Lord's resurrection and before Pentecost. You remember in Matthew 16, verse 17, when Jesus, he's asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And Peter uh, gives that confession given to him by God, okay, his his father, Jesus' his father, he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And 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 the Lord commends him for these words. Blessed are thy as are, are thou Simon Bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. Well, fast forward a few verses. Go down to verse twenty three of the same chapter, twenty three, and then Jesus, I mean Peter says words that are uh, motivated by Satan. He actually said, this is not going to happen. And then and, and Jesus has to uh, rebuke him and tell him to get behind him, Satan, because he knows who's behind what comes out of Peter's mouth. And that is Satan. And Satan is behind every destructive word that comes out of our mouths. And the, the Bible has so much to say about the word, how, how we use our tongues and how uh, what comes out of our mouth are like arrows. Once 
the arrow leaves the bow. It cannot be retrieved. It hits the target and it causes destruction. There's so much we could say about the destructive power of our tongue. I think James uh, is going to say more about this in a later chapter, but I think he's he's begun here to give great metaphors that are easy to understand. And we need to understand that uh, although uh, it, James may sound like, uh, hey, it's a useless cause, uh, you're never going to be able to tame this tongue, uh, you can't control it, and so forth, you're not going to have dominion over it. That does not mean that we are not to be trying to do that consistently and continuously. No, we're never going to be perfect in anything until the Lord comes and changes us, gives us, transform us into his own image. We're not going to be perfect, but we are to continue to try to keep our tongue in subjection. We're to, and, and of course, we want the tongue to mouth what is in our hearts. And, and from Philippians chapter 4, the Lord gives us uh, uh, instructions as to what to keep in our hearts and minds. And I'm going to read verse 80. I love this verse. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So if we're thinking on those things, virtuous things, the praiseworthy things, the pure things, the lovely things, what's going to come out of our mouth? Okay? Uh, patient words, encouraging words, loving words. And I pray, God, I'm praying for myself as well that I would be more faithful in practicing the proper use of my tongue. So we pray that God uh, has given us a little better understanding of how we're to use our tongues. And we pray that uh, he will bless you and he will keep you till such time as we meet again.